Well, let me read to you now verses 19 through 23 of Romans 6. Paul writes, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. We spoke about that last week. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, last week what we said is the weakness of the flesh that Paul is referring to here, and in some of our translations it says our human limitations, but it's, it's taking the word weakness and flesh, which is in the Greek, which we have said as we look at this passage that every reference to the body, every reference to our members, every reference to the flesh, it is referencing something that is subject to sin and a proneness towards sin. And so the weakness of the flesh here is a proneness towards sin. And then particularly what we said is, in light of the protest that's being made in the, and the answer to a question that Paul is giving, the question is, uh, you know, basically, let's sin that grace may abound. If we're not saved by the law, then let's just sin. And the, the individual who's actually protesting that, that the gospel and the grace that Paul is presenting to us, the salvation that comes through Christ alone, through faith alone, and what Christ alone has accomplished for us, and that Christ would freely give us, somehow works against living a moral life. And the reason that person wants to live a moral life is, he wants God to owe him something. He wants to contract with God some activity that he does so that God in return has to give him something so that he can create space between himself and God. So he can, in a sense, indebt God to himself. And this is revealing the weakness of the flesh. And the weakness of the flesh ultimately is a desire for independence from God himself. A desire to, in a sense, separate ourselves from God's rule and God's dominion and God's domain over us. And this individual is even proposing that his righteousness and his pursuit of righteousness is, and this is true with most individuals, a way to somehow attain it by their own deeds and by their own activities in such a way that they can put a claim upon God. And, and at that point, at that point, they have something of themselves they can preserve and something that God owes for them. It's a way of maintaining their own independence from God. Paul's answering, saying, listen, I'm going to speak to you because there's a weakness in your flesh, this proneness to seek independence from God. And as a result, I'm going to give you an analogy of the Christian life that you might find a little uncomfortable. And it's maybe not the complete expression of all that the Christian life is because there are other wonderful analogies of the Christian life, like being the bride of Christ or like being sheep in the hands of the tender shepherd to Christ and like being the body of Christ of which he is the head. But Here's one for you. You're slaves of God. You're slaves of righteousness. Before you came to Him, you were slaves to sin. And when you gave your life to Him, you indentured or you enslaved yourself to Him. And so now you need to live in light of that new bondage, you might say, to the grace that God has given to you. And you have to be willing to become a slave of His. In fact, the reason that people want to trust upon their own good works is because they don't want to enter into that place where they're completely dependent upon God alone for their salvation. That would make them a slave of something God has freely given to them. They'd rather earn it. And no, when you turn from your sin and you turn completely to Christ, at that moment you've turned out from and He releases you from the bondage and slavery of sin, but you find yourself now bound to grace. You find yourself bound to that thing that was freely given to you. But here is the weakness of the flesh. It's this weakness or proneness towards independence from God. And there's another thing that I, I, I want to do. I, I, let's read to verse 19b now. That's kind of 19a. We addressed it last week. In 19b, we addressed this too in part, but I want, to, I want to address another matter that's introduced to us in this passage. As far as je, for, it says here, Paul says, For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So we spoke of the fact that Paul in this analogy is raising up before us the prospect that all individuals live under one or two points of bondage. Uh, all individuals have uh, one or two masters. All individuals are slave to one of two things. Either they're a slave to sin or they're a slave to righteousness. And by the way, when Paul speaks of righteousness, he's not saying you're a slave to a behavior. 
It's actually saying you're a slave to a person because later on Paul will define where righteousness ultimately is found. He says you have become, in verse, I think it's in verse 22, he says you have become or having become slaves of God. Our bondage to righteousness, our lending ourselves to be bound to righteousness is ultimately found in the righteous one. By the way, your bondage to sin in the past was ultimately found in the evil one. You were under the dominion of the God of this age. He's held you bound in the sin that he was promoting. And so you became a slave of sin, but ultimately followed back. There was a greater master than sin behind it. And when you become bound to righteousness, to the things that are right and good, you're ultimately bound to the righteous one. That's what it's referring to here and talking about. And these are the choices. And what we said is in, in, in this first point that we made is that that uh, there is a, a future for both of these different bondages or these uh, points of slavery. If you're bound to sin, you're just going to go into increasing sin. If you're bound to lawlessness, you're just going to go into increasing lawlessness. But if you're, you're bound to the righteous one, he's going to produce in you an increasing fruit of righteousness. And this is the future that lies before you. And that's what we kind of considered in this second half of verse 19. But I, I want to emphasize something else here. I want you to see here that the Christian life begins when in faith one turns to the Lord Jesus Christ as one who delivers us from sin and sets us under the hold of his perfect righteousness. And that living the Christian life is one of ongoing presentation of ourselves to this deliverer from sin, this one who works righteousness in us. And so the command here is to continue to present ourselves, our bodies, to be used as slaves of righteousness or of God's righteous will, as slaves of God. And the point that Paul is addressing in the Christian is he's he's saying that the Christian is somebody who has already presented themselves. He says, you have presented yourself as slaves to God, but he's at the same time calling them so that they might live out the hour of that repentance and faith on an ongoing basis that they might moment by moment yield themselves up to the mastery of God, that they might, in a sense, he's calling for the Christian to assert themselves in a certain way. The odd thing is he's calling them to assert themselves in surrender to this mastery because that's what you're doing when you gave yourself to sin. You were just, you thought you were in control every time you step into sin, but you were literally just asserting yourself to yield yourself up to sin. Now I want you to assert yourself in a different way. I want you to make yourself completely available and I want you to yield yourself completely, not from this proneness towards independence, because by the way, if you don't make it a habit and pattern of your life to yield yourself to this ongoing bondage to the righteousness and the righteous one and to God, your flesh is going to constantly be working to sweep you back into a state of seeking independence from God. That's the proneness of the flesh. So now what I want you to do is, as once you had presented yourself in a, and you had a ongoing pattern in your life of presenting yourself to uncleanness, now I want you to continue presenting yourself as one who's given over to and yielding yourself up hour by hour, moment by moment, to, this, to the disposal of the righteous will of God. Now, it's at this point in time something we have to say. We are, this is what we have to say, as Christians, as ones who have given our life to Christ, we are not the ones who have the power to live this Christian life. We've said it a number of times from this pulpit that there's only one person who's lived the Christian life, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he wants to live that life through us. He wants to express his power and his life through us. And so the command here is a command to yield ourselves up to that work of Christ within us. At the same time, although we, are, we do not have the power in our own flesh, by our own abilities, by exerting, in a sense, our own mental energies and our own effort to live out the Christian life, we are not also called to live the Christian life in some kind of passivity where we just wait around until God moves upon us to do things. No, we're, we're commanded here to get somewhere. We're commanded here to get to a point of action, a point of decisive action where we enter into a yielded, surrendered obedience to God. And Paul actually gets to the same point. Here he says, present yourselves as slaves to God. You know, the slave is not in control. The slave is not the one who wields the power. He just makes the presentation. Paul makes the exact same, using in a sense the same construction 
And in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he's going to get to the same point. In Romans 12, verse 1, taking all that he's going to say in the book of Romans and kind of compiling together one point of application for the Christian, he says, I beseech you therefore, by all that I've said, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, all the things that I've just told you of how God has mercifully brought you into this wonderful salvation, fully by his grace. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And so there we're told to present ourselves as sacrifices. Here we're being told to present ourselves as slaves. Can I tell you that slaves and sacrifices have no power in themselves? It's God who has it. It's the one we yield ourselves up to. And yet there is, in a sense, a call upon us to take action. Again, the Christian life is not this passive life. It's a life in which we step into obedience. I, I think of the, the account of the uh, story of the nation of Israel crossing from their wandering in the wilderness into the, uh, across the Jordan River at flood tide into the promised land that God was calling to move in. And, and they were being led by the priests that were carrying the ark. And the priest stepped into the flooded waters of the Jordan. And it wasn't until they stepped into the flooded waters of the Jordan that the waters parted in order that the nations could pass through. Well, that's, that's a yielded up obedience. But as they were stepping in, they do. We'll never make it across this river unless God does something. And God did something that was God's promise. So it was yielded faith. It was active. It was vigorous. It took a bold, decisive action on their part. But it was confidence that God was going to do something. And God was going to act. And Again, Paul, Paul says the same thing here to us. Paul says the same things here to us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, the same idea. There he writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Keep on obeying. Work out your salvation. Step forward into this vigorous activity. There's the obligation to step into obedience to the righteous will of God. There is the initiation into action where you present yourself to act and doing what is right and good and according to God's will. But here's what the promise is to the believer. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Christian life is not lived out in our own flesh. It's not an assertion of our own powers but is also not lived out in this passivity that I just referred to, where we're waiting on God to do for us what we're not willing to do for ourselves, or as we sit around and just say, well, God, you'll have to do something, or I'll just be here, or... No. We submit to obey. We present ourselves in that obedience, and we move out into that obedience, but <laughs> we know our own flesh, and we know the power of Satan and sin that is against us, and so as we move out, we believe in faith that God will do and God will work through us as we present ourselves to him in that way. He expresses his mastery, and we believe this, over us as we step out in faithful obedience to him. And so on our part, the duty is to act, is to present ourselves daily to him and to come forward in obedient, worshipful surrender to his lordship and believing that God will take us. God will in that act take over our lives. And God will work into us his own holiness. Just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present, it's a command, your members, your body, your life as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So that was a part of that passage that we didn't consider something vigorous on our part as we enter into these things, something that we're being called to do. And then we mention that there is then this future that rises out of it, this ongoing development, just like there is a, a development of ongoing uncleanness and sin when we present ourselves into slavery. There is the ongoing promise that we'll be conformed more and more in the image of Christ and more righteousness as we present ourselves as slaves of righteousness. Now let's look at verses 20 and 22, and very quickly I'm going to consider another thing that we considered last week. Here's what we read in verses 20 through 22. Through 22. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But now what fruit, uh, what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? 
For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and it leads and its end is eternal life. And so we're looking at these two points of slavery and we're seeing in these two points of slavery two different outcomes. One is a future of ongoing uncleanness. Another is the future of a developed righteousness and sanctification, holiness and Christ-likeness. The next thing we look at at these two different slaveries is they offer to us two different forms of freedom. There is a freedom that you experience when you decide that you're just going to live for yourself. When you're going to unshackle yourself from the moral restraints of your family or from your culture and you walk out to your woodstock of living for yourself and finding your own free way and there is in that moment a celebration of that you've been unshackled and you're free to pursue your own way. There is. There is. The Bible calls it a pleasure of sin for a season. It's only for a season, but in that season there's a certain kind of excitement certain kind of thrill that you have when you feel like you've got out from underneath the burden of all those demands and you get to explore for yourself and express yourself and live for yourself and it's a freedom and satan promises you to it satan comes along and says here it is you are liberated you're free live in that freedom for any time and what you'll find out is the only thing that you've set yourself free from that the only thing you've actually are independent from the only thing that you've separated yourself from is being right and being righteous. What we said last week is, that's a serious thing. Because deep down inside, that's what you're made to be. You were made to be right with the world and right with God and right within yourself. And when you're not right, when you're not right with yourself, life is Life is full of confusion and disappointment and greater and greater disenchantment because you're getting further and further separated from the very thing that you were made to be, which was right. So you find individuals who are pursuing morality apart from Christ and pursuing trying to be right and good apart from Christ, and it won't work and it will fail, but actually that instinct is an expression of what deep inside they want. They want to be right. They want to be right before God. They want to be right in themselves. They want to be right with the world. And he's saying, listen, if you keep pursuing this independence where you live free from the constraints of Jesus Christ and the constraints of the saving grace that he gives you and the rule of God in your life, you'll gain a certain kind of freedom, but it'll be a freedom from the very thing that you want and you need and that you desire and that is basic to your humanity. It will destroy you. And so instead, it will lead you into a life of destruction. But God offers us a freedom God offers us a freedom where He comes and He cleanses us from all our sins and he, he saves us from the bondage of that sin and He places upon us the freedom that comes from being released from that sin and He binds us up into one thing and that is being put right with God and Himself. What a wonderful, liberating bondage that is. What a fulfilling and completing freedom that is because now it's freedom to be what you were made to be freedom to experience the essence of what God had put in the echoing desire in your heart. And I know it's true. Listen, I know it's true. You see it in the life of every individual. It is a flickering flame, but deep inside of them, what they had going and pulsating that drives them in any kind of way that makes them ability to live with life with any manner of success or order is there's this flickering impulse or desire to be right. (coughs) To be right. And it's the great frustration of their life. And even why individuals give themselves up to the profusion of sin is because it's an expression of the grave disappointment that somehow can't be right in themselves. They want to be right. And well, seeking your own independence from God will not bring you into that state. Coming before Him and yielding before Him and receiving what He freely gives you through Jesus Christ will. That's the freedom you want. Here's the third thing we saw here. This is the area that actually we, we stopped at. And we didn't get into. And so this is what we'll consider today. It's, I want you to see the fruit of both of these slaveries. What fruit, he writes in verse 21, what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? You see that? For the end of those things is death. From the things of which you are now ashamed. The things that you are now ashamed. Now, I want to say something here, and I think we need to understand this. The person who's leads their life before coming to Christ, that person who is not a believer and not a follower of Jesus Christ, has, if we looked at their life and that they looked at their life, many blessings that they can count and recount. 
blessings from family and friends and health. They have happy memories of victories and accomplishments. There are moments in which they have experienced kindness from others. They have the satisfaction that comes into life from knowing that they've made a contribution or they've been useful to others. These are all things that God gives to all people. But having said that, Paul is saying here that there is something that has not fully registered in the life of an individual before they come to Christ. Something they have not fully realized or understood. And the thing they've not fully realized and understood is this. Shame. Shame for their conduct and their behavior. They have something to be ashamed of that they are not ashamed of like they should be. And now, this is contrary to everything that our day and age is taught. We are taught that above everything else you need to avoid and the most destructive thing in your life is shame. And yes, it's true, there is misdirected shame. You, you don't have to be ashamed for the way God made you. You don't be, have to be ashamed if you have curly hair and you wanted to have straight hair or if you have straight hair and you always wanted to have curly hair. That's just the way God made you. And you don't have to be ashamed for ashamed of what people do to you. You don't have to be ashamed of what you don't have to be ashamed when somebody pulls your curly hair. You don't have to be ashamed of that. That's their problem. But you do have to be ashamed if you light your own hair on fire. If somehow to make an impression or to gain attention or to prove yourself, you do something destructive to yourself. Now, you have to be ashamed of that thing. And your effort to prove your own independence from your creator, from everybody else that's trying to constrain you, you set your hair on fire. Well, then, yeah, you knew you, you have to be ashamed of that. And daily, individuals are doing things to themselves. And their effort to somehow express their independence from their creator and from the culture around them. And thinking that they're all to blame. And as a result, in the pursuit to exert their own independence, they do shameful things that they should be ashamed of. That's a misdirected shame. I think that uh, the fact is, in order to not feel this shame, we oftentimes can manipulate things to avoid the, where our behavior leads us. And so we live in an age, as I said, which has taught us that the great need of all people is above everything else a positive self-esteem. And it's become an idol for individuals to such an extent that if your behavior doesn't reflect what you believe is right for your life, then you're told not to change your behavior. You're told to change what you believe in. That somehow you're believing in the wrong thing. And so, for example, if your behavior is such that you, you believe that what you ought to do is love other people, but you find that you're consistently not loving other people, then you need to change your belief. What you need to believe instead is that you really can't be good for anybody else until you really learn how to love yourself above everything else. And if you believe what you ought to do is think of other people first, you need to change your, because your behavior shows that you're not doing that, what you need to change your mind is, actually, you need to think of yourself first. You need to live for yourself, and you need to commit yourself to being good to yourself above everything else. And so what you've changed is you've not changed your behavior. You've reconstructed your belief in order that you might not be ashamed that your behavior is not comporting with what you believe to be true. And it's all an attempt to escape this sense of failing that you have within us. And we do this because we've been taught that shame is the great enemy of the individual and his or her need to realize a positive self-esteem. I just want to tell you what I think about this. We're moving a little bit beyond the text, but I think this is true. I think this is true because this text is telling us that what is necessary in sense and what is lacking is a proper sense of shame in the individuals, individuals who haven't been awakened by the Spirit of God. And what I think is this. But, I, but God has given to everyone some measure of that sense of shame for behavior. I think that shame is evidence of a certain kind of positive self-love that's in an individual. You know, the Bible says you're to love your neighbor as yourself. That means there is certain things that you can do that is loving toward yourself, that it's approved, that it's good. And, and actually, I think at times when parents try to level some sense of shame at a child's conduct, they're exerting upon their child that positive sense of self-love. I said it before that there are individuals who feel uh, good about themselves because they've been useful. Well, that's a kind of a self-love that's not necessarily bad. It's the fact that you love yourself and you want to be useful in the world. Well, that's okay. That's all right. That's something that God has given you. Well, here's another one. 
God's given us a sense of shame, and I think that sense of shame is a reflection of this positive self-love. It's, it's evidence that there's a part of you that loves yourself so much that you want yourself to be good and to do what is right, and you're not, you're not pleased to settle with any kind of happiness that's acquired for yourself and satisfaction that's acquired for yourself in any moment or over any time that is not gained without an accompanying goodness. You want to be good and you want to be right still. And once somehow you get things for yourself and you acquire for your things and you get experience that even bring you pleasure, but they don't go together with what you believe to be good, you feel shame. It's like a regulating thing that, of self-love that God has given to us. And there's a way, by the way, you can kill that. You can diminish that impulse. Just keep doing the wrong thing over and over again. And eventually, the shame will go away. Your conscience will be sheared. Give yourself to the habit of the environment of the things where you've compromised your sense of what is good and what's right and what you believe to be good and right, and eventually you won't feel shame. You'll be able to conduct yourself in those things without that sense of shame. But what you're doing is you're killing that thing in yourself that was good and was presiding and guarding over you with tenderness. You're killing that proper sense of self-love for an improper sense of self-love that is destructive. You're, you're killing the thing that was vital and alive within you. You know, G.K. Chesterton said that uh, an individual should not be proud of the fact that uh, the things that their grandmother was shocked at is something that they have become accustomed to seeing without hearing and seeing a hearing without being shocked. You shouldn't boast that somehow you've, you've raised above the shock value of the generation went before you. This, by the way, was something was actually promoted when I went into ministry that you had to have people come to you and if they shared with you the sins and the things that were in their life that you needed a person who was shockproof. Well, I don't think that's a good thing. To be shockproof. That somehow you're not, don't find a sense of offense at the things that are taking place in people's lives. I don't think that will help them. I think that's occurring to the very thing that's bringing them to grave danger. Chester goes on to say that it may be that your grandmother was an extremely lively and vital animal, and you are a paralytic. You're a moral paralytic and sensitive to the very things that are going on around you. By the way, most people's high view of themselves, you know, that positive self-esteem, is not based on their behavior anyhow. It's based on what they imagine or believe they would do in any given situation. You know, if I was that person, I would, well, I would never say, well, I would never do, et cetera. I think William Kirkpatrick in a really wonderful book called Psychological, Psychological Seduction says that most individuals are their own armchair quarterbacks. They all say all what they would do in any given situation, but actually they'd fumble the ball in that situation, in that circumstance, and shame comes when you realize that's the truth, that your life actually doesn't follow what you believe to be good and right. And, well... That's the state of where we found ourselves in our slavery to sin. Our own consciences were seared and our sense of true shame was weak and absent altogether. But when the Spirit of God broke in upon us, He woke us up and we saw our sins and we confessed them for what they were and we found a Savior who delivered us from those sins and who set us free from the very things that we should have been ashamed of. And so Paul, speaking to the believer, says, what fruit were you getting at that time from the things that you are now ashamed? And so, again, it's clear here that Paul has turned his full focus to talk to the born-again believer. And let me just say this. Only those persons who have been transformed by the saving power of Jesus Christ can feel the true depth of shame found in past sin. We feel it. I never knew what sin was until God awoke me to my sins and redeemed me and saved me and poured in His clean, pure life and the vital life of the Lord Jesus. And that life stood in contrast, indelible contrast, to all the selfishness and sin and pride of my own life. And whenever it came upon me, whenever the impulses of those old ways came upon me, I began to see, and the Spirit woke within me, a sense of their shamefulness. Their shamefulness. Now, that doesn't mean that the Christian lives under the stain of the past. Our past sins and our sinful attitudes no longer bring us under condemnation. And they have no ground of 
making an accusation against us because the Lord Jesus has bore their punishment and their guilt and he's, he's washed us clean, but we're free from the voice of that condemnation. But a sign of repentance and true faith is that you no longer take pleasure in the memory of sins you once took pleasure in. You no longer take pleasure in the memory of those things now that you see were shameful. And I just want you to note that the whole of a person's life before coming to Christ, although there are good things and there are wonderful things and there are things that they can look back upon with fondness, the sum total of the life is something that has shame upon it. Before they came to repentance and faith, it has something that has shame upon it. There are, of course, those sinful actions they engaged on that they, didn't, they weren't sensitive to, that they can't, but now they look upon and see they were shameful. But there also was within their life a sense of self-accomplishment and self-righteousness that they held within themselves that once they come and see that they were all in righteousness and all of the righteousness was like filthy rags and Christ alone is righteousness and all of his righteousness is all that makes us right before God, they're ashamed that they ever boasted in those other things and exalted themselves in the works and the engagement of their morality, of their of their abilities or rising up and towering over other individuals. They're ashamed of those things. And at the same time, they're, they're also ashamed and they, they think of all the good things God did for them and all the blessings God poured upon them and that in all of that, they didn't return to God the, 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 the return of gratitude, of yielded, repentant gratitude. The Bible says the goodness of God is meant to lead people to repentance to turn to themselves to Him. And now they look back at all those good things that God did and all the ways God blessed them, and they say in all that they never were truly grateful because they never returned to Him in the midst of those things. They just turned into themselves. I must be a good person because God's blessing me. And when they come to God, and they believe in Him, and they see what sinful creatures they were without Him, they're ashamed at even, to some extent, the memory of those good things because it didn't produce the surrender that it should have been. Then there's the fruit of a life independent of God that was accumulating, was driving them into judgment and death and things that they freely did without consciousness of their selfishness and the harmfulness and the uncleanness that shames them. They should. If the Spirit of God has changed them and transformed them and brought them to life, we should, in retrospect, look upon those things and think how, how shameful it is. How shameful it is. What a shameful thing. These are the things that were driving me into hell, into eternal destruction. Even these good things that I ignored, where I ignored the goodness of God and didn't return a surrender of gratitude to Him. Some years ago, my children were following an individual, a pastor who was quite successful, and uh, it gathered their interest, and it gathered the interest of a lot of teens and, teens, and they would come back and talk to him about things he was saying and they were teaching, and one of the things they noted was that he liked to regale the audience with funny stories of the sinful follies that he had once lived in for, before being saved. He liked to talk about the times and the crazy things he did when he was stoned or when he was drunk. And this was a, a regular part of the recounting of how he delivered his messages to those that were gathering to him. And I, I warned them in regard to that. Somehow it doesn't seem right that you should in a sense, delight in regaling people of the stories of your fallen past and to go into those things and to gather a snicker from them. These are the very things that brought him under judgment. These are the very things Christ suffered on the cross and endured for. This, these were the things that were leading him into eternal death and ruin. And Now, this individual, sometime after that, was found out that he was continued to live in sin. And people didn't know it, and he lost his ministry, and he had to step away from the pastorate altogether. And that, now that's anecdotal. I mean, like, that's not the, that's not why it was. That's not evidence that what he was doing was wrong. The evidence is this: these are the things Paul says of which you are now ashamed. And a vigorous salvation, where we receive the regenerating work of Jesus Christ, doesn't give us liberty to rejoice in the sins of the past. It makes those things. Shameful to us. Our delight is in Him alone and the one who saved us and delivered us. And it's a good sign that you are ashamed of what you were and you're glad to be free from that bondage. That your delight now is in what is right and what is good and what is pure and what is peaceable and, and in, in the righteousness that comes from Christ alone. That's a good sign. Let's look at verse 22. 
But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get, uh, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. Instead of meditating upon those things and drawing back upon those things that you are ashamed of now, instead what you have is a, a projection of what God is doing in your life and what He's producing in your life that's creating greater and greater holiness, and you see He's leading you out into a future of everlasting glory and eternal life. And you glory in those things. Not what I was. That's shameful. But what He's making of me. And how He's working in me. And how He's changing me. And so my glory and my exaltation is in the fruit that the Spirit of God is producing in me of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And as I see those things, I rejoice. And you know what? When I see the fruit of my past things, work, my past life, working themselves in my life, I'm ashamed of them. They remind me of shameful things. Oh, God, not that. This, I yield myself to you again. Oh, God, produce in me these things. I yield myself to obedience to you in these things that lead unto everlasting eternal life. That's the fruit that this bondage to righteousness produces in us. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit pouring out upon us the life of Jesus Christ and expanding and growing until that time when we shall see Him as He is and we'll be like Him and we'll reign with Him forever and ever. That's the delight and joy of the believer. Not some titillating sense of satisfaction or snicker of the past. Shameful things. You turn from those things. Verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we've talked about the future or the, uh, of uh, these two bondages, the, the freedoms that these two bondages offer us, the fruits that these two bondages offer us in order to just follow our alliteration here. We might here talk about the spiritual finances behind these two slaveries. The wages of sin is death. Paul in this passage has in mind he uses a phrase that refers to the kinds of change that were given to Roman soldiers, to, to uh, a little bit of conscript money they gave. But in this passage, because Paul is talking about slavery, he's, he's talking about the pocket change that a Roman owner might place into a slave's pocket as some reward for services that he's rendering to him. The Roman owner appears to be generous because the slave has seemingly earned it, but the slave is still in bondage. And his bondage is leading him into death and... It makes him a little bit happy, but he's still a slave, and he's still living in sin, and he's still, you see, still in the same place. What the passage here is telling us is that the only thing that you can earn, and the only thing that you work for, and the only thing you can produce by your own labors is death. It's just death. We, we share this with individuals who think they can earn their own righteousness or save themselves by their own good works. We have them read this passage and say, here's the one thing that God says that you can work for and earn from God, and you've by the way, you've already earned it because in a conversation we'd have with an individual, one of the questions we ask him is, do you believe that you're a sinner? Another question we ask him is, how do you know you're a sinner? What do you do that convicts of you of sin? And they'll tell you. They'll tell you things. And then you'll say, well, let's go back to this passage. says the wages of sin. And by the way, it's, it's the wages of a sin. What you earn by one sin is death. And that's what you, If you want to work for something, this is the one thing you can earn from God is death. And it's brought upon you because of your bondage and slavery the sin and your failure to be able to produce the righteous that God requires. But we share with them what death means. Death always in the Bible means separation. And this tells you that sin spiritually separates you from God. That sin is bringing upon you a physical death in which your body and your soul will be separated and your soul will be cast apart away from God forever. And that's eternal death. That's the third death. You'll be separated forever and ever. And that's what you earn with your sins. That's what's coming towards you. That's the end result of this slavery that you're under. But there's a free gift that God wants to give you. A free gift that God wants to give you. You don't earn it. You don't, earn it. You don't work for it. He's gained it all for you, and He freely lays it before you, and it comes to you when you reach out to it and receive it with an empty hand. That's repentance. Repentance empties its hands of everything else. You empty your hand of your sin. You forsake all those things. You empty your self, hands of your self-righteousness. You reach out with an empty hand, and you take... The free gift of everlasting life through Jesus Christ. And you can have that today. And it's yours. And it'll wash you and it'll cleanse you and it'll set you free from your sin. But be careful here. Because when you come to Him that way and you receive Him, and you take hold of Him that way, well, 
You'll be bound to him as a slave. He'll be Lord of all. He'll be master. He'll take hold of you. He'll deliver you. But you'll be his forever and ever. This passage began in Romans chapter 6 with Paul reminding us of what God had done for us when he regenerated us. He put to death the old man and he gave us new life. And so we were the, when we came to Christ and believed in him, we were regenerate. We were made new people. And Paul then again renews and against the argument of why the Christian goes on to live a holy life. And the reason is not only has he created us as new people, but he also renews and adds this point. Not only have we been made righteous and had his righteousness poured into us by this regenerative work, but also when we came to him and we received his gift, we became slaves of his righteousness. That faith, holding on to him, binds ourselves to him in such a way that we are free from sin, but we're bound to righteousness. That's what we need. That's what we want to take hold of. The Christian, by the way, lives their life wanting only that. Ultimately, it's that. The decisions you have, the difficulties you face, the challenges, the discouragement, the, you know, the, 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 the uh, doubts, the struggles, whatever they are, ultimately boil it down to this equation. Come before God with this equation. God, I want to be right before you. I want your righteousness. I want to be claimed and held by righteousness now. If you don't, you don't want heaven because that's what heaven is. I want to be claimed and held forever in your righteousness and I'm going to be right with you and I want to be right in myself. God, I forsake anything, anything that draws and pulls me away from that. And If it causes me pain or suffering or difficulty or hardship, so be it. So be it. I want to be right with you. Let's bow our heads in this prayer. And that position of righteousness rests in the finished work of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and opened himself up that he might give to us all of his life and all of his vitality that he may systematically go through our being to loosen and break every hold of bondage and claim the enemy has against us. Lord, we thank you and praise you. What a lie the enemy tells us when he tells us that we are held in condemnation for past sins. Lord, we take no delight or glory in the sins of the past that we have committed. We see how shameful they were. But, oh, God, how wonderful in your saving work that we are free from them. We're bound to the righteousness that comes in Jesus Christ alone. We give you glory for that. We worship you. And do we, we respond by presenting ourselves to you again for this purpose, to be mastered by you, to be mastered by you. And we give you praise for that in Jesus' name.